All right. Uh, I want to, uh, so I am acting as just a proxy. Uh, unfortunately, Kalei could not make it here uh, in person, so he's going to give the presentation via Zoom. Uh, so I want to take, I want to give it over to him uh, and let him uh, do his presentation of the big leap, picking the right Drupal journey. And you are on. Thank you, Sean. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to my session on the big leap, picking the right people journey towards Drupal 10. I am Kalai Chalun. I have an people at this. Um, so I work at Accelerant. Uh, I, we are the, an integrated global delivery partner for agencies and customers that puts care into employee happiness engineering excellence and customer success. So going direct into the, the big leap, uh, so uh, we, we all uh, know that uh, doing a migration or a transition from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9 plus version, this is a big leap. And uh, uh, we also know that uh, as for the latest update, Drupal 7 end of life has all, also been extended. Uh, and uh, it, it may most probably would be extended next year also because they are that they will be evaluated again uh, in the next year. Uh, so uh, considering that, the most predominant question that would be in our minds is that uh, should I still migrate to Drupal 7, 8 plus or Drupal 9 plus versions? So the answer is yes, because uh, of a lot of other reasons or benefits that we would get due to this upgrade. And uh, being in Drupal 7 is more like being in the comfort zone and uh, we, unless we come out of it, we would not know what Drupal 9 plus versions are, have to offer for us. And uh, uh, considering that Drupal 10 is also planned by the end of the year, it is a good strategy to upgrade to Drupal 9. Uh, one of the main reasons being uh, Drupal 8 end of life has also extended, so we can't upgrade to Drupal 8. Uh, and we have to go to Drupal 9 plus. Uh, and we, can, we are also looking forward for a lot of improvements in Drupal 10 to the end of the year. Uh, some of the major uh, 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 things that we would get in Drupal 9, I would quickly highlight this, like uh, we get better performance due to big pipe catching strategy, uh, removal of a lot of duplicated code from uh, 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 from Drupal 8 uh, and also a grade of uh, uh, Symphony uh, with Drupal 9 and uh, we also get omni-channel support uh, by where we get uh, uh, support via RESTful web services module and we can use the state to communicate with uh, in an endless way um, to other uh, more apps or any other systems that is not in Drupal. Uh, we also get better editorial experience uh, by using CK Editor's latest version 5 and also we have uh, ways to integrate the most popular Gutenberg in the editor along with Drupal and Drupal 9 and plus. So we also have better, uh, better uh, flexibility in managing the entities. Uh, like uh, every every entity or anything that you see in Drupal 8 plus and Drupal 9 and 10 is going to be fieldable. Whereas in Drupal 7, not everything was fieldable. We can create fields for media, user, taxonomy, and that is really useful uh, for us in a lot of ways. And we are also looking forward for automatic updates strategy, uh, strategic initiative by which uh, the update to Drupal 10 is expected to be more seamless. Uh, and uh, finally, we have good accessibility support by uh, mainly due to the Olibro and the Claro teams being uh, made as the default. And we have oral alerts in core now in Drupal uh, and also semantic and uh, more semantic HTML5 elements and contributed modules like uh, CK editor accessibility, auditor, all in one accessibility or modules like that. Or also extending the already available accessibility support in Drupal core to the next level where we can really provide uh, an equal uh, platform for everyone. So I would like to start with the question, like uh, what are the aspects you would want to consider when moving from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9? So 
usually the things that we consider in this case are like the content types, the taxonomy, and the modules. Then we, we also want to think about the roles and the content workflow, uh, how we want to make these to work together, and how are we going to manage the media in the new site. And also, this is also a good time to do some uh, uh, field re-engineering work. Uh, we will talk more about what I mean by field re-engineering and that's in that when we arrive there. And then there are also other aspects which we can consider during this uh, uh, taking this big leap because uh, it is a major change and maybe there are a lot of other aspects also you might want to consider later. So, and finally, we also want to focus on documentation and uh, making the clear on uh, so how we document whatever we decide to do and uh, why, uh, what are the reasons behind uh, the decisions that we take. So I would like to start with content types, but uh, if, if there are any questions, you can interrupt me and, uh, and uh, we also can discuss on the questions at the end of the slides. So about con first, the first and foremost uh, thing that we are more uh, worried about are the content types, and of course it constitutes the major uh, part of uh, Drupal. And uh, it, it is also important at this point of time to have a clean slate and uh, to not uh, worry too much about the constraints that we have had in Drupal 7 uh, because uh, there were a lot of restrictions uh, from a technical level we had in Drupal 7. So we need to just keep that aside for a moment and uh, believe that anything is possible. And uh, by by doing uh, going with the right approach, uh, I think anything is definitely possible uh, in Drupal. Uh, so Apart from that, what we did here in this case was uh, we categorized the content category content types uh, based on one particular uh, one particular uh, uh, thing, which is like whether the content type relies mainly on the body field as its information source, or whether it also derives its information from other rich other fields as well. So for content types that rely heavily on body as the information source. Uh, what we did was we merged those them into the basic page content type in Drupal 9 uh, and also we created a mapping field that, is, that also shows the uh, all the content types that are in Drupal 7 uh, so that when, when the migration happens, uh, we have uh, content, we have the mapping about uh, what content type this content belong to in Drupal 7 and we also have the body field which has most of the data or all of the data for that particular content. So, and for other content types which require a good number of rich field sets, we add them as the separate content types. And it's also important to consider what content types we can drop if we are not using. So, in this case, it's important that we ask meaningful questions like, uh, like for example, are we using all the content types in the first place and are we using all the fields that are present in the content types uh, are these content types mostly shown as aggregate from aggregate pages or whether they are shown in a full view on a single page or what is the form, mostly view format for this content type and are there any changes that we need to make in the way we want to store data like field level changes particularly also if we want to migrate all the data from Saturn or whether we want to mean back some data so we have to decide on the content retention policy also and also can we change some data during the migration like do some pre-processing before we migrate the data to Drupal 9. So these are some of the questions that we can ask around the content type structure, fields and this usage in the current site. So I just want to show this table which we used for uh, uh, for, uh, how, uh, for when we used to analyze how we can understand the content type in a much more uh, detailed manner. So we created a table for each content type where, where we noted the content type name that, that we want to migrate this to B9. Uh, first, that's the most important question that we need to ask. We should not assume that everything that is in Drupal 7 needs to go to Drupal 9. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule like that. It depends on the business, it depends on the site, uh, whether the usage of the content type and a lot of factors. And we also want to know what roles use this content type so in order so that 
let's say that we are we are deciding to drop this content type then the role using that content type might also become obsolete in that case so and we want to understand where this content type is used whether it's used as end user pages or we are just adding that content type to store some data supporting data that can be shown in other content types and things like that and also even if we are showing it to the end user whether it is internal page or whether it's a first level page alone or uh, first level in the sense in the site site map let's say that we, this content type is mostly coming in the first level then it means that it's the most important content type or it's coming fourth level or fifth level for seo purposes it's recommended we do not make the user navigate more than three levels so at least uh, we need to make sure that we are not migrating content types that are at a very deeper level and not even visited by the user frequently in the existing site so these are some of the things which we can check to validate whether we want to migrate this particular content type and to what extent we want to migrate so these are the different aspects uh, which we want to consider for the content types any questions so far no no questions so uh, we can we will now proceed towards the next topic which is about the modules and the taxonomy so in this in this uh, topic we what we did specifically to modules was that uh, we categorized the modules based on moscow rules of prioritization uh, where we categorized them into required and uh, well, like a kind of optional modules in the required modules we further uh, divided them into must have modules and should have modules the must have modules are of course the core and the contributed modules in drupal 7 uh, which are now in drupal 9 core and uh, the other other set of modules which are should have modules are modules which are actively used in the contributed module as contributed modules in drupal 7 but uh, uh, we also want to use those modules in drupal 9 because they are very heavily dependent on in the drupal 7 set so for each of these modules uh it is important that we did a similar analysis analysis like shown in this diagram like uh, we wrote about each module what are the sub modules that are present what are the configurations that are present and uh, uh whether we want to remove replace or upgrade the module and the main another point i a column i want to highlight here is the usage column which kind of shows whether em yes w or c which stands for must have should have could have or own that so uh, so we categorize the modules in this way so that uh, we know that uh, these are the modules that we need to first install to the site like the must have and the should have modules and could have modules are something that we need not install immediately but uh, it might be needed later on so there are a lot of scenarios when we develop uh, the drupal 7 site we might have found a lot of utility modules that might be needed at that point of time but uh, later on it it is not actually needed so we can actually uninstall those modules but we would not have done it in drupal 7 so it is important we do this validation during this uh, move so that we are not just adding the modules blindly just because it was there in drupal 7 but we really evaluate its need in the new site and we reduce the uh, size or the number of modules because this will help us in the maintainability of the site in the long run and uh, it is also less prone to vulnerability vulnerabilities due to this uh, so this is one major aspect that we want to consider when considering the modules and also we want to revisit the taxonomy so we we want we found that we need some new taxonomies uh, that are needed to better categorize the some of the areas of the site and also we have to change we have to change some of the way we categorize the existing content by changing the taxonomy name or adding more fields to the taxonomy and things like that because this we could not add fields to taxonomy obviously in drupal 7 and uh, it was not in core at least and uh, these are we can leverage this uh, uh, use this features in drupal 9 8 plus uh, versions so moving on to roles and permissions so regarding roles and permissions there are a lot of aspects that we want to consider starting with uh, whether we we have given very minimal access to roles because during the course of time as and when we add more users uh, 
uh, we tend to give a standard set of uh, permissions to the rules, uh, which which kind of uh, creates a lot of rules also. We will see an example in the next slide on how we can optimize the number of rules. And also, that's, that's why it's important that we have minimal rules in the side. And it's also a good chance to do a user cleanup uh, because uh, we may not migrate all the users that are in Drupal 7. For example, a lot of users we found were blocked or they are not anymore active in the site. So we can just migrate the users who are active in the Drupal 7 site and we can just focus on those users. So if you consider that, the number would be pretty significantly less than the total number of users and that also reduces the migration time. And one last aspect we would want to consider is that uh, whether we want to do manual role mapping for these users or whether we want to do uh, migration scripts. Uh, migration scripts in the sense whether we want to write the migration scripts to do the mapping of roles to these users. Considering this is a one-time activity, most of the cases, when we migrate data from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9, we just want to do a manual mapping because uh, we, we don't want to spend a lot of development effort in writing the migration script for just a one-time activity. So this is also one thing which we can consider. And uh, another, uh, these are the common issues I have also shown, the common issues that we, we have faced in, in this ma migration. And uh, it might resonate with the issues that we are also facing, which are like uh, too many roles and duplicate permissions available, and the delete permission has been given to not as many roles and the pattern workflow might not be that clear or the reviewers are not uh, or, or sometimes if the, the content bypasses the reviewers and gets published because published access is given to roles that, that are not supposed to have the access and uh, also there are other uh, there are very minor changes that might need to be done to roles like uh, uh, renaming the roles for better clarity for the administrators. So these are the various things that we want to consider um, um, about the roles and permissions. So let me proceed to an example. So this is an example of uh, how we can use roles and content workflow uh, in conjunction with each other so that they give us the optimal, this optimal or minimal number of roles. So it, because it's very important how we use the roles to achieve the content workflow we want. So. I, I can, we can say like clean roles is content restriction, it is a combination of content uh, restriction role and a content moderation role. So let's see with an example and an alternative suggestion. So in this example, let's say that uh, we have uh, four roles and uh, with role A having access to create and edit content type A and role B has access to create and edit content type B uh, and also publish that content type. Role C has access to create, edit content type, both A and B, but they don't have access to publish the content, any of the content types. Role D has uh, create and uh, create A and B content types and also publish it. So role D has access to do all the operations. So what we can see here is that as we add more users, we tend to create roles that exactly match what the users want to do, which is like adding more permissions to these roles and uh, uh, and what that creates is the number of rules. So the number of rules gets increased and the people page uh, becomes really wide with a lot of rules uh, and it's very difficult to even see uh, what permission is there and uh, which rules and those permissions. So the alternative to this is that uh, role, we can create rules that are restricted to certain content types. So as I said, when we create content types, which will be relatively limited to the number of users or less than the number of users, uh, we can create roles uh, for which, which have access to create and edit those specific content types or not. And we can also create roles that are very content moderation or content workflow or content moderation specific. Like the certain roles can only do publish permissions or to be exact, only one role should be able to do publishing. So what we can do now is that as and when the users get added, we can create combination of these roles so that it fits the user's requirement. So that uh, we can give the user role A and role C if they want to create, edit and publish content type A. And similarly, if they want to do everything, they can. we can give them all the three roles, role A, B, C to the user. And Drupal works that way in a very good manner. And this is how we can 
reduce the number of roles that are present in Drupal 7. And this is one good exercise which we can do. Uh, though it uh, takes a lot of time when doing this exercise, uh, it actually reduces the number of roles uh, that we have in the Drupal 9 side. And it is a big relief for the administrator also, so that uh, we also need to train the administrator how to assign the roles to any user based on these uh, combinations that he has. So this is one good approach which, which we have done and it has, it has been working good. Uh, so this is some, one thing which I want to uh, highlight. So proceeding further, so we want to be also mindful of uh, uh, what, how we choose the modules or what are the modules that we choose. Uh, we have came across these different modules when we did this. And uh, uh, this is like, uh, so if, let's say for example, uh, you, you are cat uh, categorizing your content based on taxonomy terms and a lot of things are proved based on taxonomy term. Then you can use permissions by term module to give access to specific content that are tagged in these terms. So this this module does that very in a good manner, and and uh, this is something that we have used. And if you want to decentralize the admin admin power uh, and not give that to one role like administrator or user one role alone, and you want to decentralize the uh, power of publishing and deleting content uh, based on the various sections of the site or various content types in the site, then you can use the group module. Uh, and it's very stable in Drupal 9, and, and I, I hope believe that will be a Drupal 10 version. So, uh, if you're using uh, sites with a very simple workflow, not that much complicated workflow, then we can use content moderation, which is available in Core in Drupal 9. And uh, we can use workflow module. Uh, if we have already used the workflow module in Drupal 7, there is a migration path available, and we can use that. Uh, this is, of course, different from the workflows module with the yes that is that are in Drupal core itself. So, and if there is a need for to have a dashboard and to send email notifications whenever content is uh, pending for your review, show what are the content that is uh, uh, that needs to be reviewed by a particular person. In those cases, if there are requirements like that, then we can use the workbench suit, which consists of workbench, workbench moderation, and workbench email. And finally, so one one thing which we have noted that is that there is no trash bin or recycle bin in Drupal 9. It is available in Drupal 7. So an alternative to that would be uh, using the archive content transition in content moderation. Or there is a module called node revision delete, which uh, kind of runs a cron job to iteratively delete very old revisions, which you can set like from this time frame, I want to delete these revisions, which are which are, which I consider to work. So you can, these are alternative to trash bin in Drupal 9, but that is not a same exact trash bin that we have in Drupal 7 in Drupal. Yeah, that is an opportunity for contribution there is. So, um, yeah, so this, that's all about roles and permissions, and uh, uh, if, if there are no questions, I can proceed with the media management. There are questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, going with media management, so uh, media is one of the most important aspects uh, that we want to handle in any in any Drupal website because uh, it, it drives the traffic and also uh, there are certain uh, certain uh, business needs to have a, a website rich in media or some websites uh, might not. Uh, focus much on media they want to they might have textual content more they want to show textual content or some sites might be very specific in what kind of media they want to show like whether they want to show videos specifically or some sites might contain a lot of audio files and there is the needs vary from every site to site so it's first important that we check these things analyze what are the requirements or business needs to how we want to store the media and what is the future scope of media in the site also uh, like I said, so some sites want to be rich in media and some sites would want to be mostly textual. So based on the need, we need to identify what is the future scope of media at the site and uh, whether we want to be media rich or not. And finally, we also want to check uh, whether we can use the same feed to store different types of media, like uh, whether we want to have a single field to store uh, you know, images, uh, audio files, uh, videos, and things like that, 
or whether they, we wanted to add separate fields. So based on this, there are three options that we have, which is having fields for each media type separately, like it was in Drupal 7. Uh, and uh, our, we can add single field via the media model, and the user can be allowed to upload different types of uh, media at the same field. So this will reduce the number of fields that is there in Drupal 7. And also finally, uh, we can also create our own custom media uh, by adding our own metadata and things to that, uh, to that particular media type. So, so this way we can leverage the field-level properties of media also. So these are the various aspects that we want to consider when doing uh, the media migration and how we want to manage the media in the Drupal 9 set. So again, I also wanted to highlight some modules which uh, which were very useful uh, or we came across when we migrated the media. So let's say that you are using a simple image or video or field file field path. Uh, in this case, this is a single field that just shows a simple image or video. In all these cases, file entity browser is a good module that can be used to browse the media. Uh, but is an uh, equivalent alternative uh, to media browser in media module. So if let's say that you go to the route of uh, using the media module in code itself, then in that case we have the media directories module and also bulk upload module to upload a lot of media and also to browse the media in a very uh, editor, editor friendly way. And the media, one thing to note about the media directories module is that it provides only virtual directories and uh, they are currently working on doing it as a actual physical mapping to actual directories in the file system. So uh, the community is working on the same uh, to map it to actual physical directories. And finally, there is also drag and drop support available in the media directories module, which, which you can drag and drag and drop your files directly into a uh, drop space in the media in the or a for that particular media field type. Yeah. Going going forward, uh, so we will now discuss on what kind of uh, field re-engineering can be done during this uh, while we are taking this big leap from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9. So the goal here is to relook the data types of each field and uh, validate whether we justify those data types and the data currently present for those data types. For examples of this is, there are a lot of cases where we use plain text instead of text field, CK editor instead of plain text. Uh, we have a CK editor in Drupal 7 where we just give one or two words. Uh, we don't have uh, CK editors uh, kind of a a good amount of content there. And we also use list text instead of taxonomy terms. So these are some examples of how we can change it, field, change the field types so that uh, uh, it is very easy for the editor. And uh, uh, we also reduce the database storage. Uh, and uh, for the editor, they don't have to scroll through a very big uh, node edit or node add screen. Uh, and they can they are so on the edit page or the add page becomes very very clear for the editors as well. And, uh, and uh, also that is better user experience also because of the fact we use the exactly the fields that we need to use for these specific field types and uh, hence we get the proper formatters uh, for those field types so we can render those fields in a, in a really good way. So this is why it's important that we do uh, the field re-engineering work or uh, validating all the field types when we do this uh, migration from Google 7 to Google 9. So we will now look at what are the other aspects that uh, uh, you can consider uh, apart from all these things that we have seen now is that, uh, so we can we can look what are the integrations that are available uh, for us uh, in the Drupal 7, like for example, uh, search, solar search integrations or uh, or, uh, or uh, the social media integrations and any third party integrations that we have done in Drupal 7, we also need to migrate them or migrate that data and integration configurations to Drupal 9 as well. And we can ask some questions like are there, or do we need all the things, whether the, uh, can we represent these things in a much better way, like changing these field types, and, uh, and also whether we want to change any properties of these fields like default values 
uh, or uh, whether, whether we want to change the required property of the sale types and things like that. So, and finally, um, so we need to also consider whether we need to do some pre-processing as part of the migration because we are migrating a huge amount of data now. It, it would be much uh, sensible to do uh, some pre-processing in a very automated way uh, by using the migration scripts rather than uh, doing them manually for all the content, which which is very difficult and almost impossible with, when it, when the content uh, content size is very large for your site. So these are the various aspects that we want to consider uh, apart from the topics that we discussed so far when doing this migration. So finally. We, we come to what are the next steps that we want to do uh, after we have done this. The one main thing is uh, documentation. We must document the above aspects very clearly as it says the decisions are uh, made and what, what are the routes that we have taken and why we made these decisions. Uh, so because it will bring clarity to the development teams that is going to actually implement all these and do the migration from Google 7 to Google. Uh, and uh, also what to document, so it's important we document every decision that we make and the why is behind the decision uh, so that it makes sense for the team when they actually work on it. And they can take, if they want to change some decision, then they can take a sensible call there. So I want to end with an example here on how we did the uh, uh, documentation for a particular, for every content type that we did. So in this case, for every content type, we add a brief description uh, that says uh, uh, what what the content type is, what is the purpose of the content type, and what the content type aims to solve. And also, what are the field level requirements of the content type that we documented each and every field that is available in Drupal 7, and uh, what are the equivalent fields in Drupal 9, whether it will be the same field, or whether we are dropping a particular field or whether we are going to rename the field and things like that. And also it's, it's important to note down the discussions that happened uh, as comments in the same, we created Excel, Excel or Google Sheets for this. And it's also import, important to note down those comments or discussions that happened around these themes so that we have the history of, uh, of what are the decisions made for every theme. And we also need to consider the content retention policy like we discussed whether we want to migrate every all the content for this content type or only some some content or in this world or two years back or three years back content. And also we also documented what are the aggregation pages, how the aggregate pages will look, what are the sorting types that will be in the aggregate pages and things like that. And uh, what would be the default sort to that level of detail we documented everything during the discovery phase of the project. And we also documented what are the filtrations that will be available and how the user can drill down in these aggregate pages to see multiple results. And how the full view design or the full view page of this particular content type will look. Uh, the designs of this particular uh, content type for full view and what fields we want to show. Maybe we want to hide some fields which are there in the content type and not shown in the full view. Things like that. Uh, we noted down all those intricacies here. And finally, what are the migration considerations that we want to do? Uh, like, for example, whether we want to change some field types like we discussed or any conditions that we want to add while do, doing, the, doing the migration and things like that. And mainly, we want to also document what are the assumptions we made while doing all this so that uh, it justifies the decisions that we take and whether they, they can, the team can also validate whether the assumption has gone wrong or the assumption has changed now so that they can uh, take a better decision in future. And finally, we also need to give the references or uh, what are the different references that we use to arrive at these uh, uh, decisions and uh, uh, what, what references the team would, would be helpful for the team uh, with respect to this content type. It can be external or internal references. Yeah. These are the various aspects that we uh, considered when documenting something about the content type. So similarly, we documented the media approach, the various topics that we discussed, every topic we documented uh, in, our, uh, in our documentation space. Uh, here we use confluence and you can use whatever documentation space that you are using. Uh, and, but, but it's important that we document all of these so that uh, uh, we have a clear record of what we do.
So the question was, this is great for planning, but are there tools that can actually handle the migration piece? Uh, for the, yes, for the uh, that I... for, for the content. Content types. Content types, sorry. Okay. So there are the tools in the sense, uh, there, are, there are tools like Migrate Plus or modules like Migrate Plus and uh, modules that support the migration. But one point to note here is that uh, it doesn't provide for, for, for people, for non-developers, it doesn't provide a perfect UI for them to map the content types and migrate it. Appear provides such a migrate uh, uh, interface where you can migrate, uh, uh, you can just map the fields in Drupal 7 and map the fields in Drupal 9 and just on the click of a button it will do the migration. But another thing to, that is not available in Drupal by default, but one thing to note is that migration requires writing some migration scripts, but it is very straightforward. If, uh, if the migration is a one to one mapping for the fields from Drupal from the source to destination side. And writing those migration scripts is very simple, uh, but mostly in real time use cases, it's, it's very rare that we get that straightforward migration that we just need to map the fields from source to destination. Mostly it will be like we have to do some mapping, we have to do some deprocessing and post-processing. So that's where Drupal comes here in the picture and that's why it's important that we write these migration scripts so that uh, we, we can actually see whether we want to change something and do it. But to answer your question, uh, kind of a ready-made click of a button module is not available in Drupal itself. Uh, but there are supporting modules like Migrate Plus, uh, which, which is also available in Drupal 4, which we can use to migrate simple sites, which have a straight forward use cases for migration. Does that help answer your question? Now, Migrate and Migrate Plus are used for migrating content. I'm like, if you have a Drupal 7 site with, say, 10 content types, and each of those has 20 fields, mm -hmm. Do you recreate all that in Drupal 9, like manually, or is there any way to like, you know, help that process along? Yeah. So the. Okay. Okay. Were you able to hear that? Yes. Yeah. I okay. Got it. So you're asking about how we migrate the configuration first before we migrate the. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. Got it. So uh, for that, um, there are uh, some some uh, modules like Node Export. Or I mean, not mode export, config export. Uh, we don't have that's a major disadvantage in Drupal 7 because we don't have configuration export. But uh, what we did here in this case, I can tell you what we did here is because we evaluated each and every content type. So and also the fields. So it was okay for us to, to create these content types and fields manually because we wanted to validate the field types and everything. Uh, so it, uh, so we did not use a tool here, we rather did it manually because uh, we validated a lot of things like we discussed now. So in this case we did it manually only, so as far as I am aware, um, there are, there are uh, for configurations, uh, I have to check, but as far as I am aware, I don't think there is an automated way of moving those content types to Drupal 9. So, yes. Thank you. Any other but uh, just one one thing to highlight. Sorry, but one thing to highlight there is that uh, we can do that automated way if we don't have any changes to make in the content type. Um, but uh, if if we want to reevaluate re the content type and themes, uh, I would suggest you do it manually. Though it's a one-time effort, uh, it's a huge amount of one-time effort, but still in the long run it would be beneficial for us to uh, so that because we have minimal content types, with minimal themes in a more optimized way in the new side. Any other questions? All right, there are no other questions.
All right, Clay, we are all set. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to contribute before we end? No, I just want to say thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity and uh, thank you for accepting me with virtually. So, thank you. Yeah, no problem.